the way like the YouTube content creation in general works for this game is a lot of the content nowadays is focused on things like PvP because in terms of end game content, there isn't a whole lot. PvP can be repeated over and over and over again, but the game itself comes to an end at some point unless they release a new world. Long live the spiral. All the PvPers like know each other uh, to some extent. Like it's a very small world in the sense that you you know over time if you're in the community long enough you kind of you sort of know who everybody is. It's sort of like uh, best way I could describe it is like going to like a big high school or something like that. You know you you know you know of basically everybody there, which is like kind of cool because then it brings everybody together, which is interesting. So it's an it's a very strange dynamic in the sense of like everybody sort of connected somehow even like you know smaller youtubers or you know bigger ones like most people know about everybody that's in the community hello welcome back to another one versus one um i am using autumn gem this time who uh just today turned uh grandmaster sorcerer so this is my first duel as a grandmaster Back in the day, it was very different in terms of deck building and how the games went. It was a lot slower paced than it is now, uh, at least with like max level. You would have, um, you know, the average match time was probably around the 10 minute range, maybe a little bit more, uh, which is definitely bigger than it was now. And you would play it a lot more defensively, I guess. Like you could afford to do different cards on different turns. You know, if you wanted to minion or weakness or bubble or shield, want it, what, like there were many cards you could do in a turn and it'll be okay but in the meta how it changed as you know time went on especially with Darkmore, you really needed to you know do the exact card for pvp at least like when you needed to um like if you didn't pull a hit when you needed to you'd probably lose the game if you didn't pull a shield the turn that you needed to you'd lose the game uh because of how powerful like shads were and stuff obviously the meta changed a lot between you know level 50 up until level 100 um but most noticeably i would say uh, like the biggest shift in PvP was when um, Shads came out in Pierce Jewels. That was huge. Celestia was so big. I'm pretty sure that's when Critical was introduced, and it just really changed the whole meta for everything, not just for um, PvE, but also PvP. I would like to say there are like three major phases of Critical. So there was an earlier phase, right? The first phase, where Critical was double damage, which means if you. If you ha it's like a stat that ha that makes you have a probability of criticaling, and if you critical, then you do double the damage. So that's insane, right? Like the whole point of of the way spells are valued is the fact that you have to wait, and every turn you get pips, and eventually you'll get the pips that you need to do a damage that's associated with that value. So if you have six pips, you're you're expecting to do six pips of damage, but with critical off of that chance, you could do twelve pips which is literally double the wait time to get to that point. So it was a very, very valuable stat to have. The only thing is there was also block and the way it used to work is for every crit rating your opponent had, if you had block rating, it would cancel that out. So someone with 300 block could never get crit on by someone with 270 crit, no matter what their probability of actually doing it was. So that's how it used to be. And then it changed somewhat and they basically made it so it was like a 1.3 multiplier because some people were just dying immediately because it's double damage like especially the spells got more powerful and right now literally like i want to say a week ago they made the last final big change and up to this point heals did not follow the same rules as hits so they would do double they would actually do a 2.3 multiplier on those and you can't block your own heal, right? So block was irrelevant to that. So they changed that to 1.3 recently. So that's like the third major phase. So now, critical is much less useful than it used to be. 
I think the most recent one, uh, that's like, I don't call it groundbreaking, is like the spell audit. And this is like, this is a big deal. Like, 10 years ago, right? They made spells that have existed in this game until this point. And the community has been so vocal about some of these spells being too powerful, too weak, unusable. Especially when it comes to person versus player combat, PvP. Like, they, they were, like, some, some spells needed to be revamped. Like, they needed to, like, fit into, like, the 2020 model of Wizard 101, right? So, the spell audit was a big deal. They basically rebalanced a bunch of spells. They actually standardized how they would value spells and why they did that. Like, they were transparent about it. It's a huge update in terms of devs talking to players and the game actually changing, like, physically. Here's the thing, I think psychologically, I don't think anyone likes things being taken away from them, even if it's in the sake of rebalancing. And rebalancing, sometimes it meant strengthening certain schools, and it did do that. But to some, in, in some ways, it also nerfed some of the spells, right? It made them weaker. And that weakening, I think some people didn't really like. But I think now that people are used to it, I think, I, I think personally, that PvP anyways is better than it was, so... But that's my opinion, you know, I, you'll find people who disagree and agree all over the place. I think, I, I think there's two ways to look at it. Like, there will always be, in my opinion, one really, really good strategy for every school. That, that's probably, like, that's better than everything else. But depending on the school, you'll have a lot of options. I think that's the key. I think, and, and in fact, I think nowadays... The schools with the most options are also the best in PvP because you can't predict what your opponent's going to do if they have a whole number of options. And I think that's where the meta gets interesting. So, like, I'll give an example, right? Mint, right now, is probably the best school in PvP, right now. And that's because they have three different avenues that they can go in for PvP. They can summon minions. So these are things that literally, like, it's just like having an extra teammate. And if you're in a 1v1 situation... Like, it's really nice to be able to do two things in one turn with the minion out, right? So that's one way they can operate. They, they have spells that can stun. So if you successfully stun your, your opponent, they can't do anything during those turns. So they have a spell named Medusa, right? That just stuns for two turns. So if you can get it on, you can, you can prevent a stun. But if you can somehow get it on, then you have two free turns to completely mess up your opponent. So that's another strategy, right? That's a second strategy. And the third one is this thing called a Scion. And that's like, every school has a Scion, but the Myth one is really cool because uh, it has this really, it has this really useful way of buffing it up. The way Scions work is if you meet a certain condition, you can do double the damage. So that's basically what a Scion is. For Myth, all you have to do is put on two stun blocks, and that's your condition met. And stun blocks are zero pips, so you can do it and gain the pips that you need, and pips basically unlock your higher damage hits anyways. So it's very easy to set it up. So I mean, those three options themselves, they make they make Myth on another level, I think, compared to other schools. It's really cool. It's the first time, in my opinion, they've ever like gone super creative with high rank spells. And it's a fact that you can literally do double the damage. So every school has a different win condition for double the damage. And it's it's tied to your identity as a school. So so death, yeah, so death if you're low on HP, it'll automatically do double damage. It's kinda dope. Gary Smith, the programmer, kind of responsible for all the, the cool things behind housing. That guy has done some really, really great stuff with Wizard 101 housing that you can't find anywhere else. And the new stuff where you can basically program your house to do to react to its visitors. Whoa, I mean, that's kind of mind-blowing. And the fact that I can check those houses out now because they have that housing tours feature that wasn't originally in the game. I can go find the coolest houses just by, you know, going to a kiosk and, and getting into it. And it's mind-blowing, the stuff people have put together and the hours they've put into the creativity. It is super hard. It's like a really hidden thing that most people don't know. The housing community in Wizard 101 is pretty unknown because housing is definitely something that almost everyone does, but to different extents. 
There's like a whole level of like crazy stuff, really cool creative people, and they just utilize the system so well where it's like, it doesn't even look like whiz sometimes. Like it's just so good, like it's crazy. Back then, they only had a glitching system, so obviously, originally, they didn't intend for the glitches to actually go through. People just found out. I remember finding out my first, um, like, houses where people would glitch. So at the time, there was no housing tours. So there was no way to, to visit people's homes unless they were your friends, and they'll be like, hey, come over, party or something. So uh, I remember one time I went to someone's house, and they had, like, a really interesting, like, rug stacking. They get rugs, yeah, and they stack them to, like, infinity to the edge of the map or whatever. And I thought that was, like, that's so cool. Like, how did they do that? They got, like, these rugs. And then also like the envelopes and like small little rugs, the long blue trim rug, like all that stuff. So that, that was like the beginning, like the pioneer stage. And I really wanted to get into that. I was like, how do you do that? Castle magic is a way to implement interactivity is how I see it. But it can also be used just as a way to incorporate decorative uh, elements. And that's how I'd, I'd say a lot of people use it. I remember when they first introduced Castle Magic, it was like super confusing because they do have kind of like a tutorial, but it's super simple. It was like one example out of so many possibilities that were actually possible. So for the longest time, people were just kind of like fiddling with it. And then eventually Housing HQ made tutorials on how to do Castle Magic because there's a lot of things that you can do. And it might be kind of hard to figure out what spells actually do what because the instructions can be kind of confusing. You can really make like really interactive stuff. You can have, you know, people look at a certain spot that you want with camera angles. You could uh, kind of focus where you want the person to go through and really control what they see. And I think that's what really makes it versatile and adds a whole layer of frosting to the top. One of the biggest problems with the old glitching technique is that it was really hard to get things exactly the way you wanted because even it with the, uh, the utility of the glitch, sometimes it would be really hard to position things like right on the dot that you want, like let's say like a perfect circle or something, it was kind of impossible, like you'd have to just eyeball it. But right now, um, as I said, since they just implemented the advanced movement and even just even more recently, they implemented a 360 rotation movement so now they have like coordinates so you can set something like oh i want this exactly 66 degrees they implemented also on top of the advanced movement they have like another separate hud and you can look at xyz coordinates as well so you can be like oh i want this at like negative 22 z uh 1000 y and like whatever and you can legit do like math <laughs> to make it like exactly in the right spot and it's so crazy because I've seen a lot of the really recent creations from people since there was recently a really um, fun community contest with like housing. You can tell they really utilize those tools because the symmetry of a lot of their projects is just like amazing and I don't know how they could do that just eyeballing it so I'm pretty sure like you know the precision of it just makes it that much better. In a way, I would say it was not necessarily more impressive back then, but definitely they didn't give you the tools, you know, to make it easier now. It's still impressive for sure, but back then, like, if you saw something off the grid and, like, in positions where the game doesn't allow you on its own, it was super like, wait, how'd they do that? Definitely a lot easier, but that, that is the main thing that I noticed is just that the technique is completely different.